Robert Strachler. Um, you, you may have picked up in that introduction that uh, Robert Strachler and I uh, know each other. And um, I, I, wanna, I wanna thank him for the invitation and also for uh, 25 years of uh, being a Haruta. We were formerly Harutas and back in Yeshiva and we learned to hold Shabbat yeah. I guess 20 something, 20 years ago or so. But, um, but I've constantly been learning from and with Rabbi Strachler over the last 25 years. So uh, it's really an honor to be with him and with all of you this evening. Um, I also just want to acknowledge, I don't know if he's there, but, uh, but I know that Jim Diamond is a member of the community, a member of the shul, and he's someone from whom I've learned a lot over the years and uh, was kind enough actually to read an advanced copy of this book and uh, write a little blurb uh, that would convince everyone that it's worth their time. So I don't know uh, if that worked, but if it, uh, if it did work, it's thanks to him. So um, I want to just uh, thank him and acknowledge him as well. All right, and I will, let me see, can I, uh, yeah, yeah, fantastic. I'm going to share my screen. Um, I'm going to, if it's okay, Rabbi Shaka, please uh, let me know if you have any objections to this, but what I would like to do is uh, divide the, so our time up into about three parts. And after each part, I'll pause and ask if there are any comments or questions. So I'll, I'll say that if anyone has comments or questions that you're going through, please feel free to put them in the chat. So you were there. Pause, I'll have a look at the chat and see what, uh, what people have been saying and we can try to respond to things and then go on to the next part. Does that make sense? Okay, fantastic. Okay, great. Um, so I'm gonna start with uh, a question that was asked by the Rishonim, by the medieval commentators and uh, uh, interpreters of Tanakh. And that relates to the very first line of the Akedah. So of course, the Akedah is the term that we give to Genesis 22, to Breshit Kafbet, which is the last parak of this, coming's week, this coming week's parasha. Uh, Akedah literally means uh, the binding. Uh, it's a rare word, ayin kufdala, to bind, but it's the word used in the story. Oh, I should also say parenthetically that PowerPoint now has closed captioning. So I turned it on because I think it can only help. So please, you know, if, if, if uh, audio is any issue, please feel free to use the closed captioning. I'm sure it'll be great, except that there's gonna be Hebrew and I'm sure the Hebrew will not work. So we'll, we'll keep it on, but please don't be distracted by absurdities in the, uh, in the closed captioning. Um, so the Akedah, the story that we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, in the, in the time we have together this evening, starts off, After these things, or after these words, God tested Abraham. And the commentators all want to know, and this has been a key question for at least a couple of millennia already, what does it mean that God's testing someone? What, what does that mean? What does that do? How does that work? Um, I don't know if there, I'm sure there are educators uh, among us this evening. Uh, so you have a, your, your sort of first initial thought about what a test is. And the, uh, the most uh, basic idea of what a test is, is you, know, you have a teacher who gives a test and uh, her students do well or not well on a test. And now the teacher knows something that she didn't previously know. Right, so I give a test. Now I know that the students only learn 72% of the material and that uh, I obviously blame on them, not on me, <laughs> and then I can give them grades accordingly. Um, so I didn't know how well they were learning that material. Now I know how well they're learning material. So the test in, in that sense is for the benefit of the one giving the test, the tester. The tester learns something that they didn't know before. Now, readers have looked at the Akedah, uh, looked at the story, and said like, well, does that make sense when it comes to God? Is it possible is it possible that God is going to learn something from this test that God didn't previously know? And the vast majority of Jewish readers, not every Jewish reader, but the vast majority of Jewish readers uh, have rejected that possibility. That, that, that a test, when God gives a test, cannot be for God's benefit because God can't learn something new from such a test. So what are the alternatives? Well, um, the other obvious party to a test is the one taking the test the test did or the testee. So can a test be for that person's benefit? So of course, again, any educator in the, in the crowd will know that a good test absolutely benefits the one tested. A really good test, someone sits down in an exam 
and they have to write some really good essay questions, they have to think hard about it, and they walk out feeling, not only did I do well on the test and so I'm gonna get a good grade, but I actually feel like that consolidated what I know, I've thought it through more synthetically, more analytically, and I walk out feeling actually more accomplished than I walked in. So a test can absolutely benefit the test TID as well. But again, most readers, or at least many readers, we'll see some exceptions soon, have looked at, at the story of the Akedah and said, you know, does Avraham benefit from the Akedah? It's hard to see that he benefits. If anything, he's tortured by this story. Uh, it's an incredibly painful test to have to undergo. And at the end of it, he doesn't seem to have benefited at all. In fact, something that we, I, you know, we're not gonna to talk too much about, but I'm happy to expand on later if anyone is interested. Um, he loses his relationship with Yitzchak, he loses his relationship with Sarah, and in fact, he never even talks to God again. So Avram doesn't seem to benefit from this test. So what's left? Like, who is this test for? What's the point of a test that neither the tester or the test did benefit from? So uh, this question was addressed by, as I said, lots of commentators, but I wanna start with the interpretation or the answer to that question given by Rav Sadia Gaon. Sadia uh, Gaon, this is quoted in uh, the commentary of Ibn Ezra, who I'll turn to more in a second, but he quotes Sadia Gaon, who we have his, his commentary as well. Uh, and Sadia lives in Baghdad, uh, or let's say around the year 1000 or so. He's not a native of Baghdad, but he, uh, he lives in Baghdad. Baghdad is then still a relatively new city, only a couple of hundred years old. There's a planned city. This is the, the famous uh, circle, circular city of Baghdad that was actually founded uh, to be the Islamic cap capital uh, a couple hundred years before Saadia. Uh, Saadia makes his way to Baghdad. And his answer to this particular question, why is God testing Avraham? As even Ezra quotes him is, Shemilat Nisa Lehar. The point of the test is not for God and it's not for Abraham. The point of the test is actually for the audience. Everyone else will see just how righteous Abraham is. So that's the point of Nisa. Nisa means to demonstrate. Uh, according to Sadigon, God demonstrated the righteousness of Abraham to the rest of the world. Now, Ibn Ezra himself, and this is really fascinating because Ibn Ezra lives uh, now a, a century and a half later. Ibn Ezra himself, I'm sorry, I actually wrote the wrong, it's eight, I apologize. Sadiqan lived 882 to 942. So he lived uh, a century earlier than I wrote here. That's just my slip of the, of the brain. Um, Ibn Ezra, who lives almost two centuries later, over in Spain, quotes her Sadiqan, and then says, but this doesn't make any sense. You know why? This test can't be for the benefit of the audience. There is no audience. As Ibn Ezra says, the Gaon knows at the time that he bound his son, when Avraham is up on the mountain binding his son and putting him on the altar, even his own attendants were not present. There's simply no audience there. So if the point of a test is to be for the audience, you gotta actually have an audience. But Avraham and Yitzhak are alone on the mountaintop. So if the point was to demonstrate something, it was really an ineffective way of doing it. No one's watching. So I, I put this map up because I think it's just uh, it's worth thinking about for a second. So we started our little story here in Baghdad. Uh, Sadiqon's commentary and his ideas travel to Spain, uh, travel to, to Della, where Ibn Ezra was born. Then he, he goes to Italy where he writes his commentary. And now we're going to see that these ideas keep reverberating around Jewish uh, intellectual life, and we'll see, we're going to follow the ideas to Maimonides here in Fustat and Cairo, and then to Nachmanides and Radak of David Kimchi, backwards order, uh, back in Provence and in Spain. So what I, what I love about this, I'm not going to make a big deal about it, but I, think, I want to just put this up to you uh, to think about it, because when we open a, a general chumash, sort of classical uh, rabbinic Torah commentary that has all these commentaries on the page and they're all sort of printed in the same black uh, font and on white paper. Um, I think it's sometimes easy to lose track of this, but these conversations are taking place over centuries and over hundreds and hundreds of miles. And that's really the, one of the astounding, beautiful things about Jewish intellectual history 
is watching the same ideas and the same questions get bandied about back and forth from country to country, from culture to culture over the unfolding century. Uh, all right, so with that little excursus, Maimonides, the Rambam, who is actually a native of Spain, but makes his way through North Africa, actually through Palestine, through Israel, and then back to Egypt. Um, Maimonides says, you know what? The, uh, the, the point is exactly as Ursadi Gohan said. The point is to demonstrate something about Abraham to the rest of the world. That's the point actually according to Maimonides. Maimonides is the guy on the right here. This is a fictional portrait, but it's useful. Uh, that is his real signature on the other hand on top of the portrait that we, we know from documents in the Cairo Geniza. Um, but, but there are no photographs in the Cairo Geniza. Um, and Maimonides says, that's exactly right. That's actually the point of every single test, every nisayon in Tanakh, in the Bible, is exactly to teach something. It's to demonstrate something. And in this case, Maimonides says, the point is to teach that the commandment to love God has virtually no bounds. The obligation to love God may extend even to the most extreme circumstances, even to the obligation in some circumstances to sacrifice one's own child. Now that's Maimonides' view. So he's essentially following Rasad Yagon's idea that the point of the trial is to teach something. He doesn't answer Ibn Ezra's question. Remember Ibn Ezra's question is still, uh, but no one's watching. Like what does it mean that, that there is a, that there is a, a uh, a demonstration that we're teaching something if there's no one there. Now, the one who does answer that question, let me just see if, yeah, uh, let me skip to this. The one who does answer this question is uh, a commentator named David Kimchi. And I'm sorry for throwing all these names and dates out, um, but, but I just want to sort of give you a taste of this conversation, and I think it'll merge with an important point. David Kimchi, known by the acronym Radak, he says, of course there's an audience. Sadi Gohan said the point was to teach something to the audience. Ibn Ezra said, but there is no audience. Radak says, but of course there's an audience. It's just not a live studio audience. Who's the audience? Well, the audience is the, the literary audience. The audience is the audience of readers. It says, the audience is everyone who reads the stories, which would include us. Radak actually says, you know, it doesn't just include Jews. Who reads the stories? He says, well, I know most of the world. Radak sitting in, in 12th century, 13th century Provence says, most of the world reads the Bible and takes the, ser the stories seriously. That's the Jews, that's the Christians. It's true, we disagree with them about certain things, but they also are part of the literary audience of the Torah. It's the Muslims who also have a story of the Akedah and the Quran. Uh, so everyone reads the story, takes it seriously, and learns something about the righteousness of Abraham Avinu. So it's true, there was no one up on the mountaintop with him. No one saw it happen live. But lots of people have read the story and take the story seriously, and that's the audience that the story is written for. Now, that's one school of thought. So I want to just sort of summarize very quickly to this point. So we have this idea, this hypothesis put out by Sadia, who said, the point of the Sayon is not for God, it's not for Abraham, it's actually for the third party, it's for the audience. Ibn Ezra said, but there is no audience. Radak says, of course there's an audience. The audience is the literary audience who reads the stories. There is a different view though. And that other view is the one developed by Nachmanides, Moshe ben Nachman, um, who lives basically in, in 13th century Spain. And he says, no, no, no. What do you mean there is that the, that the test does not benefit Abraham? Absolutely it benefits Abraham. He says one thing, but I actually think that it's, uh, the idea is developed a little bit better by uh, one of his students. But he says, the test benefits Abraham because God wanted Abraham to have the reward for doing an act of great faith. God knew that Abraham was a person of great faith, but one cannot get rewarded for potential. One gets rewarded only for actual accomplishments. 
And this actually, when I read this Ramana, I understood why I had never gotten a, uh, a medal of courage from the United States military. Because I know that even though what I do most of my life these days is sit here in my attic, facing a computer screen and talking to people, that in my heart of hearts, I am the most courageous person around. I have incredible courage. And I don't understand why I hadn't gotten rewarded for this. But the Ramban says, no, but you don't get rewarded for potential. You get rewarded for putting that into practice. So since I've never actually done anything that demonstrates my courage, it's just here in my attic, uh, and no one else knows it, uh, it's not possible for me to get rewarded for this. And that's exactly the problem that God had for Avram. He knew that Avram was a man of incredibly stupendous faith, but he also knew that unless he gave him a challenge that tested that faith, that allowed him to demonstrate that faith, he could never give him the reward for that level of faith. So we gave him the test of the Akedah, according to Ramban, not for anyone else's benefit, but actually to benefit Avram, so that Avram could have enjoy the rewards of the great religious personality that he had developed. Now that's that's great. I think it's you know it's a, actually a, a really interesting point, but I think the point was actually taken in a more profound direction by a sort of disciples disciple of the Ramban. And that's um, a, uh, a commentator better known for his commentaries on the Talmud named uh, Nisim of Girona. He lives about a century later. And that's actually whose text is up here on the screen. I know that I put the pictures of Maimonides and Achmanides, and he quotes those two. But this text is actually the commentary of Nisim of Girona, often known as the Ran, Rabbeinu Nisim, uh, in his commentary on Genesis, which we only have the beginnings of. but. Um, says some very interesting things. And he says, I'm going to add to this. I'm going to actually have something to say. Right? What does he have to say? He says, there's something actually more profound going on. Let me go here. Here's, here's what he wants to, to, uh, to add. And he was saying, but who could they see it? Chazik and Muna, the Nefesh Haminuse, Adshia, you tear Chazak, Babu Data Shamitara. He says, you know, Ramban, I, I love the idea. I love the idea that the point is to benefit Abraham. But I don't want to hang it on the triviality of the reward. That like, oh, you don't get enough reward. Here, let me give you a chance to get earn more reward. That's not enough. There is a whole other reason for people to, in, in the human realm, to put other people through trials. Why do we put three people through trials? So think about like a sports coach, right? who might say to his, uh, his star athlete, like, look, I know you've run the 100 meters in 9.9 .9 seconds, but here, I'm gonna put you against uh, you know, someone who can do it in 9.85. Let's see if you can do it in 9.85. And if you can do it in 9.85, I'm gonna lower it to 9.82. I'm gonna lower, I'm gonna keep lowering it. Why do I keep lowering it? Because if I keep pushing her, it's not only that she's gonna get a reward for running faster, but by pushing her, she's actually developing her capacity to run faster. And Ron says, that's what God's doing to Abraham. God's giving Abraham harder and harder tests because each test actually develops Abraham's religious personality. Each test actually pushes him a bit harder. So he develops his own religious personality a bit more, a bit higher, a bit higher, each of the 10 tests pushes, pushes him to ever greater spiritual heights. And the Ron says, now in general, he goes on, I didn't include this in the slides, but in general, he says, the Torah doesn't push people too hard because the Torah was meant to be sort of fit for everyone to fulfill. The Torah doesn't give us anything that's just like challenging in, a, in an extraordinary way. But for an extraordinary person like Abraham, God stepped in and said, all right, I see that it's no trouble for you to do the sort of basic things of being a good person, being a, man, a person of faith, that's all great. Let me give you a harder test. Let me give you a harder test. And the last test, the absolute last test had to be the Akedah because at that part, at that point, there is a, a limit reach, the Ron says, that uh, he had just tested him with essentially the limits of even Avraham's capacity. I don't even know what the next level could possibly have been, but he had reached the limits of Avraham's capacity. Avraham has now developed his religious personality to the point that a God says, okay, we're done, we're done. And this is a really profound point because this is, I think, focuses our attention on two things. One general point, and that's that uh, 
acting on things, acting on things that are challenging for us, actually can rebound to our own benefit so that our own religious spiritual personalities can continue to improve. And we know this in every realm of life. And, and the point that the Ron makes is it's true in religion as well. The more we challenge ourselves, the more we work on something, the better we will be. So, you know, I've been doing these uh, during pandemic times, I've been doing these workout videos. Uh, not that uh, they're making much of a difference to me, but that's my own fault for not being consistent. But anyway, the the uh, the coach guy, you know, is always like, you know, next time, if you can't do this, next time you're going to be able to do it a little bit better. You know, so I'm going to do I'm going to do 12 reps and you can probably only do a few. But next time you'll be able to do five and then next time you'll be able to do six. So that's true in in physical fitness. And the Ron's point is it's true in spiritual fitness as well. That when we watch Avraham over the course of Breshit, don't think of him as a static character who has perfected his spiritual being before we started. We just watch him sort of moving through statically. He, like every other person, is constantly dynamic. And the point of the Nisayon, is actually to give Avraham a harder test. Say, like, I'm going to raise the bar a little bit. Let's see if you can jump over this height. Let's see if you can jump over that height. And when Avraham succeeds, he has actually improved over the course of that of that Nisayon. So there's a general point. The specific point that I want to draw out of this for, for thinking about the Akedah is that the Akedah is itself a dynamic story. That even within this story, I think the point that the Ran is making is that Avraham develops over the course of this story. There is dynamism, there is development over the course of Perak Kafbet. It's not just revealing something about Avraham that was true before the Perak, and now we know it at the end of the Perak. But when Avraham binds his son on the altar and is prepared to part with him and actually to sacrifice him, that's, it's not clear that Avraham was able to do that before the story began. Avraham's ability to do that may have been, in fact, gained over the course of the story. So that, I think, is a really important point because we can watch even someone as great already as Avraham develop over the course of the narrative. And that's something that I think was, is, uh, is quite important for thinking about the story. Um, all right, last thing before I take our, our first break. Um, and that is just a point that um, I think is worth emphasizing about the trial of the Akedah. So of course the test, uh, I, I didn't offer, I haven't not yet offered a quick summary of the, of the story. So let me just do that very quickly. I know it's very familiar, so I apologize to you, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, and that's that God tests Avraham and says, take your son, your only son, Avraham, uh, Yitzchak, sorry, uh, and take him to uh, a mountain in a place in the land of Moriah and uh, offer him as a burnt offering. And they go together, he collects all the stuff, they go together. Um, they go with two attendants who are then left behind at some point. Yitzchak realizes that the, they have all the accoutrements for a korban, for a sacrifice, but they don't have the actual sacrifice. He asks his father, where's the sacrifice? Abraham makes some vague response, which um, uh, maybe we can talk about later if, uh, if we'd like. And uh, then they continue walking on together. Abraham binds Isaac on the altar. That's the word Akkad, uh, gives the story the name Akeda. Uh, and as he's about to actually slaughter him, an angel appears and says not to do that. Abraham doesn't do that. Instead, he sees, no one tells him to do this, but he sees a ram uh, caught in the thicket. He takes the ram, offers that as a sacrifice, and the angel comes back and says, because you did not withhold your son from me, uh, you get a lot of reward and, and your descendants will uh, be very successful. Um, and then Avraham returns to his uh, attendants and they walk back to Beersheba. Now, Martin Buber, Martin Buber has a, a brilliant observation in uh, one of his essays on the Bible. Uh, I don't know if he's the first one to observe this. Probably not, but he says it beautifully. In the, um, and I think he deserves credit for the insight anyway. Uh, he says, you know, the very first time that God spoke to Abraham, what we just read in the Kriyat Torah yesterday, the beginning of Lech Lecha, starts, of course, with the word Lech Lecha. The very last time that God speaks to Abraham, the last test that he has, is the beginning of the Akedah, which also has the words Lech Lecha, which he translates here as Get Thee. Well, uh, he wrote it in German, but anyway, Get Thee. Um, now, Buber points out that the phrase Lech Lecha 
appears only twice in the entire Tanakh. This is not a common phrase. This is not something that lots of people say all the time. It appears once at the beginning of the stories of Abraham, once at the end of the stories of Abraham. So that's an interesting observation. And then Buber says, you know what becomes really interesting? When you put these two together, you find out what the true test that God was giving Abraham was. The first part of the test was leave, forsake your ancestral home, abandon your still living father, whatever family is there in Haran, and go to an unknown land. The last test, the Akedah, is now forsake any hope for there to be a future. We put those two together, and what God's actually asking Abraham to do is to give up any hope for the past, any, any roots in the past, any hope for the future, and to live entirely in the present. Like, live just now here with me, God. No past, no future. Now, as much as today we talk a lot about, like, the importance of living in the present, which I'm all for, that's a great thing, uh, but we do that in the context of being rooted and having hopes for the future. We often have to remind ourselves we also have to live in the present. The idea of living with no past and no future is actually terrifying. We derive the vast majority of our meaning in life from where we come from, culture, family, roots, so on, and what we're hoping to leave behind us, accomplishments, progeny, biological children, grandchildren, and so on. And if you take those away from us and say, all you have is right here, right now, it's actually a terrifying idea. And yet that seems to be what God is asking him. Now, of course, at the end, that's abandoned. Yitzchak is allowed to live. And in fact, Avram plays a role in, um, in ensuring there being a third generation because he arranges the marriage of Yitzchak. And really fascinatingly, he arranges the marriage of Yitzchak to his old family. So in the end, he actually manages not only to not abandon the past and the future, but actually to bridge the past and the future and join them in setting up the uh, coming generations. But, um, but the tests that he's given are really quite terrifying. And the, the, the most basic point I want to draw out of uh, Buber's observations is just that we have to take the story of the Akedah in the context of the broader stories of Avram. It's not a story that stands alone. It started back in chapter 12. It continues through chapter 25 or so. And, um, and all through this time, we're looking at the character of Abraham as he develops uh, dyna dynamically. OK, so I will pause here. I pause here. Uh, if anyone has oh, uh, I had a, I had a thought. Say, um, so I think, um, I think everyone has the ability to just unmute themselves, right? So obviously, we're going to yes. ask everyone to uh, respect other people. But if, if you know. We can start with if anyone has sure. a comment or question. No, Rabbi Kohler, just a, a thought. I mean, just one thing, just something that um, I recall from Aviva Zornberg. When she bo uh, she talks about Lechacha as, you know, she um, uh, developed from Lechacha, be, uh, become, go to yourself, that the uh, Avram in Ur Kasim or wherever, Haran can't, can't be Avraham. And he to be Avraham, he has to leave. But if you take that second lechacha, is it that, that also the Akeda is really transforming himself into more of himself. And I still have a problem with that, but I'm wondering what you think of that. But also the other thing, the other question that of course, I think we all ask is what kind of God makes this kind of test? And then of course, I don't think you have to be a 20th or 21st century person to say, what kind of test or impact is this on, on Yitzchak? And I'll leave you, I'll stop there. Yeah, well, those are those are all great. I, I'm I'm gonna sort of apologetically defer long answers on 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 the big questions you're asking. I'll I'll say something very quick, um, but I you know you're absolutely right. I uh, I'll say that in the book, I, we'll, we'll, we'll you'll see my the crux of my answer to your your big question and uh, what we're gonna do in the second part of uh, of, of our time this evening. Um, but uh, you're you're absolutely right. It's a major it's a major problem, and I think you're actually also right that you don't have to be a modern person to look uh, askance at what's happening here and say like, yeah, this doesn't seem reasonable. And in fact, there is a stream of tradition or you know, a, a, um, a school of thought that has criticized uh, both God and Abraham for their actions in this parak that go back to the times of the Talmud. As uh, we have Midrashim, 
uh, that voice opposition to what uh, God does um, and opposition to what Abraham does. Uh, I don't know. I don't have the time this evening to step through all those sources, but I'll, I'll put my email in the chat at the end. And again, a lot of this, uh, well, some of this at least is in the book. And if there are specific questions, um, I'm obviously, you know, I'd be thrilled to get an email with questions and I'm happy to, to write back with some further sources that might be of interest. Uh, I don't think that Lech Lecha really means go become yourself, um, just on a shot level. I think it's, you know, uh, it's a beautiful, really beautiful uh, interpretation. Um, but even though the phrase lech lecha doesn't show up uh, anywhere else in Tanakh, we have this uh, this sense of uh, or this construction of a verb followed by the pronoun and the preposition of the person doing it pretty often in biblical Hebrew, and it doesn't seem to have anything to do with like um, as you're saying uh, to develop yourself. Um, so it is something like for your own sake that that may be possible, but uh, but of course that's a very vague notion. Um, so yeah, and I'm gonna. Hopefully, hopefully some of the other things you mentioned will uh, come up in the in the coming twenty minutes or so. Any other comments or questions at this point? Hi, Dr. Uh, Sorry, you go first. Go first. Okay. Um, uh, there, there are four words in the story that, to me, makes it sound like it was really a, a test and a hard test. Those four words. Those four words are not necessary hmm. because all, all it had to say was he took the, the knife. But prior to taking the knife, he had to send his hand out. He was very hesitant in doing that. That's a great. That's a great observation. That's a great. So let me let me break your comment up into two parts, if I may. Uh, the first part is a literary observation, which I think is absolutely on target and actually really important. Uh, the narrative moves really fast, right? Like it takes one line for them to walk three days. They walk three days. That's the line. They walk three days. That's it. Beyond uh, much And then, as Charles is pointing out, at the crucial moment in the story, everything slows down. It's an almost painfully slow pace, right? And now suddenly he binds him, he puts him on the altar, he stretches out his hand, he takes the knife in order to kill his son. And it takes two psukim to do essentially, you know, one motion of his hands. Uh, so that is a, a really fantastic observation about the way the story is told. It really slows down there. Um, and we uh, are sort of watching with bated breath. I mean, you know, one of the problems in reading our reading these stories is that we always know how they're going to end. But um, but if we didn't know how it was going to end, I think we would appropriately at that point say like, well, what's taking so long? Like, we, you know, we'll just get to the point already. Um, so your first, you know, as an observation, I think that's fantastic. I, the second point you know, is your interpretation of the uh, of the slowing down. So I think what you're saying is absolutely plausible. There are other ways of interpreting it as well. So you're saying. It slows down because he is having a hard time with it. And Avraham is, is actually uh, having a hard time, whether that means he slowed down or at least it's depicting him as uh, sort of going step by step at this point. Uh, an alternative is that the narrator wants us to slow down and sort of realize the drama of the moment and realize just how high the stakes are right now. And I think we often don't realize, how, again, this problem, because we all know how the story ends, is we rarely think take the time to pause and think about like, well, what would have happened if he had gone on and actually killed Yitzchak? And we realized that the entire covenantal history of God with Avraham and Zerah Avraham would have just ended. And we actually seem to have been trapped at that moment because either Yitzchak was about to die, in which case Avraham doesn't have a family to, to continue the covenantal relationship with God, or Avraham would reject God's command, in which case Abraham may have been rejected from the covenant for being unfaithful. And there's actually a, uh, an interpretation of this in the Dead Sea Scrolls that, that sort of seems to hit on this uh, perfectly. But I actually, so Charles, I love your observation. I read the slowing down not as uh, showing us Abraham's mindset, although it may also be that. I don't, I don't want to disagree with, with what you said. Um, but as asking us to slow down and actually think about the theological stakes of the moment. 
Like everything hinges on what's about to happen and we don't, don't know what's about to happen. But um, again, the literary observation is fantastic. Uh, I'm sorry, who is Sophia? The... Hi. Um, I was wondering in light of the Ramban and the Ron's approach about needing to do a test in order to get a reward, how that works considering the reward that Avram gets at the end of the Akita was already promised him at Brief and Abtarim. Like what actually is gains reward wise from the Akita? Yeah, it's a great question. It's actually a hard question. Um, and there have been some, uh, even going back you know, centuries, there have been some fairly cynical readings that, that Avram didn't emerge from this with any real benefit um, in terms of the reward. Uh, the contemporary, well, he's, he's now you know, retired, but uh, contemporary theologian, uh, David Blumenthal, um, who taught at Emory for decades, made a point, which I think is a very important point, although I'm not entirely sure how to articulate it. Uh, so I'll throw it out there and, and maybe you can develop it. He makes the point that although the content of God's promise to Avram at the end of the Perak is not so different from what he's promised him before, the, um, the authority with which he says it is uh, increased, by which I mean, for the first time, he swears, he takes a shavuot, he says, binishbati um Hashem. And this is the first time that God actually swears by himself that, uh, that Avram's yeah. descendants will su succeed materially. Uh, and Blumenthal argues that God's swearing uh, is actually a, a, an important moment in uh, this covenantal history. So he's promised things in, before, but he's never actually taken a shua, and this binds God in a way that he has not been bound in the past. Um, there's, yeah, you know, let, let me put that on the table and I'll, I'll leave it to consider. Um, I have to talk more about it maybe at the end, but um, I think there's some interesting th ways of developing it, but I'll, I'll, I'll set it aside for now and maybe we can come back to it later on. All right, so good. So I'll, um, so let me go back and I do this part pretty quickly. Oh, sorry, where is this? Here we go. Uh, so moving on from Buber, um, I want to very quickly move to a an earlier theologian, about a century earlier than than Buber, and that's also not Jewish, uh, Danish theologian Soren Kierkegaard. Uh, I'm not going to give you a lot of background to him because we just don't have tons of time this evening, but he is a phenomenally interesting thinker and writer who lives in, in Copenhagen his entire life uh, and writes primarily in the 1840s and 50s and is a really profound thinker about matters of faith and especially what it means to be a person of faith in the modern world. Um, so I'm gonna try to summarize his interpretation of the Akeda like very briefly. Uh, he wrote a book called Fear and Trembling, which I, is a well-known book and I'm sure many of you uh, have had a look at it or read it at some point. Um, so I'm not going to do it justice in this, uh, in these like, uh, like four bullet points. I'm not going to do it justice, but uh, if nothing else, hopefully I'll encourage you to go back and have a look at it because it really is phenomenally profound reading. So the crux of his interpretation is that the, the conflict in the story that Avram is sitting with is between ethics, which means universally not agreed upon, but universally discussed and articulated values on the one hand, and faith, which we cannot talk about. Kierkegaard makes a big deal about the fact that if I'm a person of faith, I still can't talk to you about your faith. I'll never know whether you're a person of faith and you'll never know whether I am. Faith is inherently individual and private. And the test, the, the uh, struggle that Avram had, the trial that he had, was to figure out whether he could abandon ethics, leave the realm of the ethical for the realm of faith. The book says that we, as readers, as observers of Abraham, have to either agree that faith can call us to, uh, uh, to step out of the world of ethics, or we have to decide that Avram was actually no better than a common murderer. Because that is what Avraham did. Avraham left ethics for faith. And either we agree that that's possible and that's worthwhile, uh, or we condemn Avraham as a murderer. But what's unethical about what he's doing? Well, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, Avraham was going to murder Yitzhak. Um, 
And the point is that there is no ethical justification for what Avram is going to do. And this is actually an important point in Kierkegaard's development. He says, I can imagine someone, think about, think about someone like Yiftach, which is not the best example, um, but someone already mentioned Yiftach in the chat and um, it works as an example. So someone like Yiftach, who you recall a story down in the book of Shoftim, in the book of Judges, uh, makes an oath that if God helps him win a war, then he will offer as a sacrifice to God the very first thing that emerges from his house when he comes back victorious. And as it turns out, the very first thing that emerges from his house when he comes back victorious is his daughter. And he says, well, I guess I have to sacrifice my daughter. He's very sad about this. And he's actually angry at her for coming out, which is absurd, but you know, it's typical uh, or blaming the victim mentality. Like, how could you have come out? Now I have to sacrifice you. And um, you know, the rabbis and the, of the Talmud and, and lots of other uh, interpreters have looked at Yiftach and said, Yiftach, with all due respect, you're an idiot. Like, you didn't have to sacrifice her. There are lots of ways out of this conundrum. But he felt, I'm not going to worry about whether he was right or not. I actually don't care right now. The point is that he felt that he had to sacrifice his daughter for a greater cause. The greater cause is he took an oath. And fealty to the oath, the fulfillment of his oath, is a greater cause than the life of his daughter. Now, we could disagree with him. We could absolutely say like, no, you're wrong. You got your priorities all mixed up. But he can articulate why he thinks he has to sacrifice his daughter. So that makes that a decision within the realm of the ethical. That's all within the realm. In other words, we could disagree that his ethical judgment is right or wrong, but he is offering an ethical argument for why he thinks he has to sacrifice his daughter. Avraham has no such arguments. So Avraham, if you had stopped him on the way, and the Midrash actually says that Satan did this and says, hey, what are you doing? You're going to be a murderer. Tomorrow, they're going to drag you into court. And they're going to say, you killed your son. You're a murderer. And you know what Avraham's defense is going to be? Kierkegaard says he will have no defense. He will not be able to say anything because faith is not universal. Faith is not something he can go to everyone and say, but you don't understand. God asked me to do this. Appropriately, if he said those words, everyone would say, you're out of your mind, because faith is something that is by definition personal and private, and he knows that he can't say anything to anyone else about his faith. So Avraham actually has to depart the realm of the ethical for the realm of faith. Yiftach's not doing that. Yiftach is killing his daughter, sacrificing his daughter, it looks like the same thing that Avraham is doing, but he's doing it within the realm of the ethical. Now, Avram is going to do it anyway. Why? And at this point, the same way that Avram can't speak, Kierkegaard says, I, I can't really say much more either. If there's nothing to say, if you understand faith, if you are a person of faith, if you are a knight of faith, then you get it. And if you're not, there's nothing I can say to you to make it clear to you. Simply nothing to say. The knight of faith can't talk. And there's the last bullet point here. Uh, Avram can be admired but you can't learn from him. And there's a quote, Abraham keeps silent, he cannot speak. When I speak, if when I speak, I am unable to make myself intelligible, then I'm not speaking. I can like stammer out words, but if I'm not, if I'm not hitting you in your heart, if you don't understand what I'm saying, because all you're doing is hearing words, that's not really communicating. And Abraham can say the most beautiful things in any language about how he loves Isaac. But it is not this that he has at heart to say. It is the profounder thought that he would sacrifice him because it is a trial. The latter thought no one can understand and hence everyone can only misunderstand the former. So in a really unfair nutshell, that's Kierkegaard's interpretation of the Akedah. Now, it's really fascinating. I'm going to gloss over this, but it's really fascinating that uh, there were other Jewish thinkers in the 19th century, like roughly contemporaneous with Kierkegaard, who went in similar directions. But a lot of Jewish thinkers, yeah, I gave you a selection here, when they read Kierkegaard, these are all from the 20th century, when they read Kierkegaard, they look at it and they're like, this is terrible. Like Milton Steinberg at the end there, Milton Steinberg, who's probably most famous for writing As a Driven Leaf, right? a very prominent reform rabbi in the US uh, in the 1940s, says, nor does anything in Judaism correspond to Kierkegaard's 
teleological suspension of the ethical, that you suspend ethics for a greater good. From the Jewish viewpoint, and this is one of its highest dignities, the ethical is never suspended, not under any circumstance and not for anyone, not even for God, especially not for God. So Steinberg's argument is, you know, this is actually horrifying what Kierkegaard says. Kierkegaard says here that Judaism sometimes might demand that we leave the realm of the ethical for the realm of faith. And Steinberg says, essentially like, chas v'shalom, religion is nothing if not based on ethics. Now, it's not, uh, it's not irrelevant that he was a liberal American rabbi. Uh, certainly in the more liberal denominations, this has long been the, one of the cornerstones of thinking about what Judaism is. Right? The idea of, of ethical monotheism, which goes back to the Nevi'im uh, being the cornerstone of Judaism. Well, that means that ethics is at the, at the root of what Judaism is. Um, I, I don't like Kierkegaard's interpretation of the Akedah, not quite for the same reason that Steinberg doesn't like it though. Uh, I don't like Kierkegaard's interpretation of the Akedah for really three reasons. And um, I'll, uh, I'll say them pretty briefly. Before I say the reasons I don't like them, I should say though, that despite, this, despite these voices that say like, oh, well, Jewish tradition has never agreed with Kierkegaard, there are a number of very prominent thinkers in the 20th century who absolutely thought that Kierkegaard was right. They, they say it in different ways, and I don't know, uh, we don't have time enough together this evening to really work this through. But on the left, you have Professor Yeshayahu Leibovich, who is a very prominent um, public intellectual in Israel until his death in the uh, 90s. Uh, and on the right, of course, is Rabbi Yosef Dov Soloveitchik, uh, who is uh, the most prominent modern Orthodox rabbi in America uh, in the 20th century. And both of them very much uh, absorb Kierkegaard's thinking about the Akedah and channel it in different ways. Leibovitch in a very extreme way, Rabbi Soloveitchik in a much more tenuous, attenuated and moderated and nuanced way. Um, but they certainly do bring Kierkegaard into uh, sort of mainstream Jewish thought in the 20th century. So uh, I don't know if this has happened in Shari Shamayim, but it's like not at all uncommon to hear rabbinic sermons in uh, North American shuls on Rosh Hashanah or this coming Shabbat that invoke Kierkegaard. Now, Rabbi Strachler is an exception, but to be frank, the vast majority of North American rabbis don't know anything about Kierkegaard. The only reason to know anything about Kierkegaard is because people like Rabbi Soloveitchik and Professor Leibovitch quoted him all the time and they channeled his thought thinking about the Akedah. But ask, you know, ask the typical rabbi, like what else Kierkegaard said besides this thing about the Akedah, you know, and the other 40 books he wrote and you get blank stares. So again, Rabbi Strachler is an, uh, an exception here. Um, but Kierkegaard has entered uh, sort of mainstream, uh, certainly Orthodox, but mainstream Jewish thought through the work of these two really towering Jewish thinkers of the 20th century. Despite that, I really don't like Kierkegaard's uh, view, and that's for three basic reasons. Here are my three basic reasons in a uh, you know, grand total of 10 words. Uh, one is that it's dangerous. Uh, this idea that religion can ask us to leave the realm of the ethical, I'm not going to pretend that never can happen, but saying that that is a, a fundamental teaching of the Akedah is a dangerous teaching. It means that we have no checks on religion. I have to say that this is actually a conversation that Rabbi Strachan and I have been having on and off for like 20, 25 years or so uh, of bringing morality to religion or religion to morality and how this conversation is supposed to go. And it's obviously, if, if there were a straightforward answer, I'm sure Rabbi Strachan would have taught it to me already at some point in the past couple of decades. Uh, there is no straightforward answer, but Kierkegaard's view, at least as it's channeled in some ways, I don't, I don't know if Kierkegaard would sign on to it, but a Kierkegaard's view as it's understood sometimes makes this, uh, makes religion essentially exempt from any checks from the realm of ethics and morality. Uh, and that's actually dangerous because I, I'm going to say it, I'm going to say this in an extreme way, but I don't think it's wrong. I just think I'm saying it in an extreme way. Um, if that's true, then if someone says to you, uh, hey, I got to go now, um, I don't know if this is relevant in Canada. You guys have like, you know, more sane people, but uh, I got to go now. I have to go shoot up some people in front of an abortion clinic, which actually does happen in 
you know, the U.S. Um, and you say, but that's unethical. I mean, killing people is not ethical. And he's, and I'm assuming it's a he. Um, and he says, oh, I know it's unethical, but my religion dictates that I do it anyway. Or unfortunately, we have Jewish examples as well um, of people who have done some pretty violent things, not because they think it, ethics dictates it, but because despite ethics, religion dictates it. And if Kierkegaard says, well, religion could sometimes ask us to leave ethics behind and just follow religion, then that is actually a dangerous thing. It's not to say that, uh, that you know, religious uh, terrorists or uh, acts of religious violence are often inspired by reading Kierkegaard, um, but it's to say that if we adopt Kierkegaard's reading, we actually don't have a great response to someone who says, well, I'm doing this despite it being unethical because my religion demands that I do that. So that's something that's, uh, it's not good or bad in terms of it, the reading as an interpretation, but it is, I think, a, a, something to be attuned to. Second thing about Kierkegaard's, um, Kierkegaard's interpretation is that it's really profoundly Christian. So this is not good or bad for a Christian, but it does surprise me that it's become a, uh, a sort of common view among Jews. And by, by profoundly Christian, I mean that Kierkegaard argues that the high point of Avraham's spiritual development is being alone on a mountaintop with God. Now, it's complicated in Judaism, but on the whole, this sounds a lot more Christian than Jewish. The Christian ideal has, since the time of Jesus, been to remain celibate, unmarried, married only to God or Christ. Whereas the Jewish ideal has always been that religiosity comes embedded in interpersonal human relationships. The ideal religious figure in Judaism has rarely been the monastic, celibate, isolated person on a mountaintop. It's not to say that you can't think of isolated examples, but they are isolated examples. And so this idea that that's the, the uh, sort of ideal that the Akedah teaches um, is very Christian and, and sort of surprises, surprises me that it's uh, taken root in, in Jewish circles. And then most importantly for the actual meaning of the Akedah, Kierkegaard simply ignores the second half of the story. The second half of the story, of course, contains another command to Abraham. The first command was, go take your son and offer him as a sacrifice on the mountaintop. The second command is, don't offer him as a sacrifice on the mountaintop. And for Kierkegaard, that's almost an afterthought. Like it doesn't actually matter to Kierkegaard that Yitzchak's alive at the end of the story. But to me, that seems like actually a really big deal. Like it, it seems very important to think about not only the first part, the first command to Abraham, but also the second command to Abraham, where God says not to offer Yitzchak as a sacrifice. Um, all right, you know what? I'm going to continue here for just another couple of minutes, and then I'll, I'll and then I'll pause. Uh, so, so I, I want to build on those critiques and just offer very briefly uh, an alternative understanding of the Akedah, which doesn't ignore the call of God and faith, but also tries to put it in dialogue with the demands of interpersonal relationships and universal ethics and morality. Now, um, I'm trying to think I had to do this uh, more briefly than I have on the slides, uh, but a number of, I'll say this, a number of commentators Maimonides, who we mentioned earlier, and a uh, 14th century commentator here, Joseph Ibn Kaspi, um, both make points that lead to the conclusion that we have to think about the two commands from God to Abraham, the first command and the second command, as a dynamic development of the relationship between God and Abraham. And this goes back to the first thing we talked about. Ibn Kaspi puts it in the following terms. He says, you have to pay attention to the names of God in every biblical narrative. If the name used for God in the biblical story is Shem Elohim, then that means that the character in the story has only an abstract, distant understanding of God in that story. But if the name of God used is Shem Hashem, then that means that the character in the story understands God in a more intimate and therefore profound way. And he says, now look at the Akedah. The first command, Elohim nisat Abraham. Elohim tested Abraham. Elohim tells Abraham to offer Yitzchak as a korban. But the second command, 
that it's an angel of Hashem who calls him from heaven and says, don't offer Yitzchak as a, as a sacrifice. What that means, Ibn Kaspi says, is that when Avraham understood God only from a distance, he understood God to want child sacrifice, to want him to offer Yitzchak as a sacrifice. But when he came to understand God more intimately, he then understood that God did not want him to offer Yitzchak as a korban. Now, what I think this means, uh, yeah, right. What I think this means is that there is a sense, I'm gonna to try to say this. <laughs> it's gonna sound strange, I'm gonna say it anyway. There is a sense in which God does want child sacrifice. That's not a false statement because look, the bottom line is what better way is there to show one's devotion and faith to God than to offer the by far most precious relationship that I have to God. I don't wanna use myself, that one has to God. Like it's very nice to offer, you know, wheat or a sheep, that's all great, but that's obviously, that obviously pales in comparison to what it would take for a person to offer a child as a sacrifice. And God gets it and God sort of wants that. Sort of. And there are a couple of psukim where like it's ambiguous. Like it actually does sound like, it. I'm not going to argue this is what the psukim mean because uh, I think in the context, they certainly don't. But when God says things like in, in Mishpatim, uh, looking at the second one here, give me the firstborn of your sons. Do the same with your cattle and your sheep. Let them stay with their mothers for seven days, but give them to me on the eighth day. That certainly sounds a lot like what God's saying is, hey, you have a firstborn? Great, you get to keep them for the first seven days. On the eighth day, give them to me. Now, again, in context, uh, we have every reason to think that's not what the Pasuk actually means. But it may be that it's expressed that way because in a sense, God does want that to be the case. Now, despite that, God repeatedly warns that you shouldn't do it. And why not? What's actually wrong with child sacrifice? It does seem like a profoundly moving, I'm gonna, I mean, I hope you don't think I'm a monster for saying this, but it's a, you know, it sounds like a profoundly moving way of, of showing faith in mm -hmm. God. Like why does, why does the Torah reject it? The Torah rejects it explicitly in Devarim and then the Nevi'im re reject it repeatedly. What's wrong with child sacrifice? So uh, if anyone wants to offer something, that's fine. But um, my suggestion would be that the reason God doesn't want child sacrifice at the end of the day is because actually the child is not yours to sacrifice. That it makes sense to offer a sheep because the sheep is actually yours, but no one would have a thought for a second that wouldn't it be a profound act of faith if I walked down the block, grab my neighbor out of her driveway and offered her as a sacrifice to God? Everyone was like, no, that's absurd. That's just murder. Like she has nothing to do with me. What right do I have to sacrifice her? And I think that's actually the point of the rejection of child sacrifice as well. What's wrong with child sacrifice? It's, it's, it's so obvious to us that the Torah rejects child sacrifice that you know, maybe we don't even stop to ask why. But the reason why I think is because the Torah is essentially saying that child is not yours the way a sheep is. That child is an independent person the way your neighbor is. And the same way it is obviously off the table for you to offer your neighbor as a sacrifice, it is equally off the table for you to offer your child as a sacrifice. And my, my hypothesis is that that's actually the conclusion of the story of the Akedah as well. That when God says, go take your child and offer him as a sacrifice, Avram says, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Child, my child, right? I wanted a child, I'm raising a child, I get to offer my, my son as a, as a sacrifice. Not to say that it's painless, obviously it's not, but it, is coherent. I can offer my child as a sacrifice. Uh, I'm not gonna read these two come together out loud, but uh, I can offer my child as a sacrifice. Um, but when the Malach comes and says, no, 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 now you don't, don't do that. What even Kaspi says, that now he understands God as Hashem, not just as Elohim. He understands God more intimately, more profoundly, more fully. What he understands is that even though in some sense, God, would appreciate a sacrifice of a child, 
he even more rejects this idea as a possibility because it's just not conceivable that Avraham's religiosity would come through the sacrifice of Yitzchak. The same way that my religiosity, my piety can't come through sacrificing my neighbor, Avraham's piety can come through sacrificing Yitzchak. Because although Yitzchak is Avraham's child, he's also Yitzchak. He's, he's an independent person who has his own standing before God. As Yechezkel says uh, later on, says, God says, Kol nefashot lihena, kenefesh haben, kenefesh av lihena. Says, you know, each person stands in front of me, like each person has their own relationship with me. A father, a parent has one relationship, a child has another relationship. And the, the parent's religiosity, the parent's relationship through, with God cannot come through sacrificing the child. Now, the important thing, I just want to sort of summarize this in two sentences and then pause. The important thing is that the story then is then a dynamic story. The story is not just revealing something about Abraham or about God or about a lesson that like, like Kierkegaard argues. The story we actually see developing over the course of the story. We see first the command from Elohim, as Ibn Kasbi says, to Abraham saying, take your son as a sacrifice, offer him on the mountaintop. And that makes sense. But then Abraham's understanding of Ritzon Hashem, understanding of what God wants from him, develops over the course of a story until it's revealed to him with the name of Hashem in the second half of the story. And then he understands even more fully that although it wasn't false that God would want Yitzchak as a korban, it is false at the bottom line. God doesn't want it. God rejects that because of this greater value of the independent value of Yitzchak. All right, you know, I'm, I, I want to develop that a little bit more, but let me pause here for a moment. Uh, I know I threw a lot out there pretty quickly. So let me pause here and see. I saw there's a few things in the chat, and, and um, if anyone would like to talk, uh, now would be a good time as well. Uh, Can I ask a question? Yeah, yes, absolutely. I'm just going to look at these as well. Please, uh, I don't know who's speaking, but. Hi. Um, I actually have two, and I mean, I have a few, but I want to focus on two. One is that in terms of, if, 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 if indeed the problem with child sacrifice is, as you're sort of saying it, that Yitzhak is an independent entity, I think that really does relate to the Pasuk that you sort of related to vaguely before, which is, which to me, as I always taught it, meant that sort of Yitzhak understood that Avraham indeed was going to offer him as a sacrifice, and but he consented. And my question would be, if the problem with child sacrifice is that the, that you're sort of overstepping your boundaries and taking someone else for your own religiosity, well, what if that person agrees that, well, because God told you to do it, then I guess that's that's what he wants, and and therefore let's do it. And if you thought was consenting to Avraham's desire to sacrifice him, then if the, if the logic is what you're saying, I don't see why it would be a problem. And my second question, and I guess you don't have to answer both right now, would be, I don't see how this is different than Kierkegaard's point. Because it sounds like what you're saying oh, is no. the reason that that it's okay that, that God, that Avraham didn't bring him as a sacrifice is ultimately because God told Avraham he doesn't want it. But if God didn't tell him that, if, if indeed God did desire child sacrifice, then what you're saying is that it would be it would be warranted, but, but he just doesn't want it. Okay, so that second point I'll try to I'll try to come back to in a couple of minutes, and and uh, I'll try to say something slightly more developed about it. That's a fair point. Uh, the first one, it's a great point. I mean, the the key question really is uh, Yitzchak's role in the story, and the in the story as you know the sort of shot of the story. It's he's simply passive. He says that one question. And all we have to go by is a lot depends in our sort of interpretation of the story on the age of Yitzchak, which, you know, interpretation, Jewish interpretations have ranged from five to 37. Um, and, and what I know of, and you have like you know, five, 12, 13, 25, 36, 37. And it really makes a big difference. I think you're, you're drawing attention to that. It really matters whether he's a full grown adult who has the ability to say, okay, Abba, I'm, I'm totally with you on this, you know, tie me up well and make sure that I'm not a, a puzzle korban, uh, or whether he is an innocent child who's being bound against his will. Um, I think that's, 
you know, obviously crucially important for thinking about it. All I can really say is that uh, the story gives him no agency explicitly. He just doesn't have a voice, literally has no, has no voice. Um, so I think you're absolutely right that you know, many of the Midrashim, which do make him into not only a chronological adult, but, but give him that full religious agency and say, you know, I'm, uh, eventually I'm totally a, a, a partner on this, um, are responding to a number of things. But I think in part, they're also responding to this problem of otherwise, like, what is this? This seems really unacceptable for uh, a person to tie someone up, even if they're their own child, like to tie them up and throw them on an altar against their will just doesn't seem, doesn't seem acceptable. So as I hope will become clear in about five minutes, I think that's absolutely right, but it's right at the end of the story, not necessarily at the beginning of the story. That, um, so in this sort of dynamic uh, approach to the story, that, that Avram might not have fully appreciated that at the beginning of the story, whereas at the end of the story, I think he would be fully on board with that, with that view. Um, but, uh, but you're right. I mean, depending on what assumptions you make, you may have come to, you may come to a different reading. I would just point out that there, there are assumptions. There, there's, you know, the text doesn't say any of it. And uh, it's not to say that they're invalid, but just to say that they're, they're, they are interpretations. Uh, and those interpretations may in fact be responding to some of these problems and trying to solve them, which is what interpretations ought to do. Um, but of course, uh, allows us to go differently as well. Um, so there are a couple of really interesting things. Yeah. Sorry, can I ask a question? I'm sorry. Yeah, please. I'm not sure how to, what order to go on. Oh, please sorry. go ahead. I, so I was just wondering, so then going back to the sort of that initial discussion about what the what the meaning of Nisa is, yeah. are you proposing then that we're really moving away from like the idea of a test even as a challenge and that it's just sort of an educational lesson and in this case, maybe some sort of experiential lesson, right? That the whole, it's, it's whether it's sort of your, the proposal number two of it's, you know, for the benefit of the person being tested or, or an and, and or the benefit of all of us as the literary audience that we're learning something, but that it's not about the, it's not about Abraham being challenged to do something that was difficult. It's about a process by which a certain lesson is learned. Um, and, and, you know, maybe what sets it apart from just like teaching is that it's done experientially in some way. Yeah, that's, that's actually a great formulation. I really love that. Um, there, there was actually a, a modern scholar, Moshe Greenberg, uh, argued that that's actually what Nisa means in biblical Hebrew, that Nisa means to give someone an experience. Um, he based this in particular on one pasuk uh, in Shemot Kaf, uh, where God is Menaseh B'nai Israel. But um, I, I, I love your formulation. I think that's right. I think it's educational in the sense of you have to go through something so that you now understand something more profoundly than you did. Um, and I think you, we've probably all had this experience where we know something in some abstract sense, but then when we experience it, it's like sinks in in a, in a much more uh, real deep way. And I, yeah, I, I like your formulation a lot. Um, so there are a couple, of, a lot of interesting things in the chat that I, um, some of it is so interesting that I, I, I wish we had more time to tackle them, but uh, okay. So uh, Sarah Kravitz put a couple of interesting things in the chat. Um, so one was that Avram's entire enterprise was to teach the world. How can we say he isn't teaching? Which is a great, a great observation. Uh, I skipped over the slide of the Malbim, but the Malbim actually makes a big deal about that. That, uh, that this is a time where Avram, the great teacher who's been walking around the Near East, you know, teaching everyone about monotheism, suddenly wants no one with him on the mountaintop. Um, so uh, the Malbim actually develops that as part of his argument that that Avram himself didn't understand how he could be asked to, to do what he's about to do. That until now, he's always taught, he's always said, come follow me, see what God wants, because he's always firmly believed that God was asking him to do something right. But at this point, he couldn't see any way of uh, justifying what God had asked him to do. And therefore he said, you know what? I don't know. This doesn't teach, seem to teach anything. I need to be alone here. And that relates also to what, uh, let me see here, Yaakov uh, put in the chat. Uh, if the ethical is defined by God, how can God command to be ethical? Um, so again, I'm not gonna try to answer that. It's actually such, a, such an important and really uh, good question. Um, I'll just say that Malbim's answer is that, in fact, Avraham asked exactly the same question at this point and said, I don't know, I don't get it. This doesn't make any sense to me. God is asking me to do something unethical. 
And I'm going to do it. And this is going to lead us back to, to um, Rabbi Bergman's point as well. Uh, I'm going to do it, even though I think it's unethical. But I'm going to point out that I don't think it's ethical. And I certainly don't want anyone else to learn from it. Um, now, Andrew Gann pointed out that many primitive, quote unquote, societies do offer their neighbor as a sacrifice. Uh, I don't know if that's true. I mean, you have things like the Aztecs. Those are prisoners of war. Like, actually, like, random neighbors on the street. I, I don't know of any examples of that. Um, like, you know, everyone, everyone does seem to have a sense that, like, someone equivalent to me can't be my sacrifice. Um, but, um, you know, I, there, there was child sacrifice in some cultures in the Near East, but there's, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's too late to start talking about it right now. And there's Diana probably, said, there's got to be a more cogent reason against child sacrifice than you ought not to sacrifice your son. God doesn't want it because your son doesn't belong to you in the way that she belongs to you. I don't know why. Why? What? what I mean, if by cogent you mean said better, uh, I would love to say it better. Uh, I agree with that. But, um, but it actually seems like a profound point to me. Why? What, what would the better? What would a better reason be to reject child, child sacrifice? I don't, I don't, Diane. I don't need to put you. Uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot. If you'd like to offer something, that'd be great. Um, but if not, I'll, I'll just say I actually think that's that's a it's really a, a profound reason, profound argument. Uh, all right. So, uh, Lewis or Sharon, uh, <laughs> you have to unmute yourself though before you speak. Mute. Oh, there you go. Ah, go ahead. Sorry, you're back to mute. One more time, one more time. There you go. I want to make a point then uh, that in the area of Ur Kazdim, from where Abraham came, it's part of Mesopotamia. And in the Mesopotamian culture, it was extremely common uh, as a ritual. Uh, to sacrifice a child. So if Avraham came from that milieu, and although he was told uh, to leave where he came from and develop a whole new outlook, those practices would have remained with him. So when he was in fervor of religious belief, either he might even have thought of that on his own. I, I don't think so because of the texts and the two aspects that you recorded. But it would have been so much easier for Avraham to accept whether it was his own thought or the belief that God told him uh, the whole idea of sacrificing uh, his child. And I have an interesting question that I would love you to answer, which I have wondered about myself for many years. When you read the text of the Chumash, you see um, on some level a lack of communication between Yitzchak and Avraham. Could you address that, please? Was it because Yitzchak knew he was intended to be sacrificed and his father was willing to go through with that, go through with it all the way. Uh, could you comment on, comment on that if you have the time? Thank you. Okay, so um, in terms of your first point, I think that's a really important point. I wouldn't pick on Mesopotamia so much. There's a little bit of evidence from child sacrifice in Mesopotamia, but, but where we really have a lot of child sacrifice is from the world of the Phoenicians. Um, and that uh, is essentially the world of Canaan. So right. it's absolutely relevant for, for the Akedah. Um, so how far is Canaan but, from Mesopotamia? How, how far um, from, from Haran, where uh, Avraham came Haran from? Haran is Syria, right. OK, so from Haran to where you're referring to now, how far is that? Not far. No, no, 100%. I'm, I'm agreeing with you in, in the basic idea. Just. You know, I want to shift the geography a little bit, but yes, I agree with you fully, and I agree with you that that's actually the point. So, so that um, in, in my book, I actually make a big deal about this. I have a whole chapter about Phoenician child sacrifice because I think you're absolutely right. The rejection of child sacrifice is important for the Torah because other people practiced it, and when other people practiced it, it's not that they're barbaric people. I, you know, I, when Andrew wrote primitive in in quotation marks. The quotation marks are really important, right? 
we might. Yeah, uh, but they came the after story. Abraham. Abraham was the first. Wait one second. Uh, but the, 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 they came the later. point is that these people sincerely worship their God in all piety and sincerity through child sacrifice. And if you had said, well, that's yeah. terrible. It's barbaric. They would have said, what do you mean it's barbaric? I said, you sacrifice a sheep. That's nothing. Like we sacrifice our children. We are far more pious. And in fact, uh, I don't want to go back to it, but in fact, the Psukim and Zvarim and in Yirmiyahu and elsewhere make it very clear that Hashem is concerned about, and then B'nai Israel actually, the Israelites actually look at their neighbors and say, wow, maybe we should be doing that. Like they're really pious people. They worship their God with child sacrifice. Maybe we should be as pious as they are. And the, the Akeda rejecting that is not just a, an abstract idea that no one had ever asked about, like, should you sacrifice a child? No, don't sacrifice a child. It is a I don't think it's a burning issue, but it's a real issue. Other people really did sacrifice their children. It makes religious sense to sacrifice children with certain assumptions in place. And the Torah is saying, well, we reject those assumptions. Since Once you reject the idea that you own a child, then it simply makes no sense. You're, um, so that's, I, you know, I just, again, want to amplify uh, your first point. In terms of the, the, the communication, so... At one level, it's, um, uh, I think you're certainly right. I, I, would simply, I would emphasize, I would take your comment and emphasize the end of the story where it's clear that Yitzhak and Abraham's communication, whatever may have been at the beginning of the story, it's broken down entirely at the end of the story. And the last line of the Akedah, again, commentators have noticed this for a long time, says, Abraham returned to his attendants and they walked together to Be'er Sheva. And everyone has asked, Avram returned to his attendants. Where is Yitzchak? Yitzchak. <laughs> and there are more fanciful answers about where Yitzchak is physically. But at a very basic level, it seems that, well, on the way up, Rabbi Bergman pointed out earlier the Psukim, the two of them walked together, the two of them walked together over and over on the way up. On the way down, at right. least they're not being said to walk together. So you can imagine Yitzchak in a different place, which some commentators do imagine, or you can at least imagine him trailing behind, but being emotionally distant from Abraham. And the fact is, and this is the chilling fact to end with uh, in response to your comment, that Abraham and Yitzchak never talk again. They're never that's even in the right. place. Their communication exactly. will be over. So I think that's an important thing to say, because even if the story is a story that you know, we can appreciate Abraham's piety, it's also a tragedy. Right. The, the family side of the story is terrible. There's nothing good to say about that. It may be wonderful ben Adam Makom, ben, between Abraham and God, but it is absolutely not wonderful between Abraham and Yitzchak, between Abraham and Sarah, uh, and between Abraham and the whole world. Right? Again, the point that Sarah made that, uh, that Abraham has always been a teacher, and here he stops. He just withdraws. There's nothing for him to teach. And it's really a tragedy on the human level, even if right. on the sort of theological level, there's something uh, important going on. Thank you. Um, okay. All right. So let me try to wrap this up with, with just the last uh, last couple of. I know we're already over time, so I apologize for that. But let me try to just bring this all all together. Um, let me move on from here. Sorry. Um, so this is a common. Uh, common sentiment. Morality is, this is a quote from H.L. Mencken, but the sentiment is actually heard very often. Morality is doing right no matter what you're told. Religion is doing what you're told no matter what is right. In other words, this idea that, that ethics and religion may in fact clash with each other. And at some point we have to decide, well, are we basically ethical or are we basically religious? And, um, you know, there might be something that challenges us to actually take sides on that, on that question. The Akeda absolutely, I think, does say something about that, but it doesn't say what Kierkegaard thinks it says. So Kierkegaard thinks it says, religion might sometimes make us leave the realm of ethics. Isn't that awesome? Let's move on. And I think that's, again, ignoring the second part of the story, because the second part of the story says that God actually takes it back and says, actually, don't offer Yitzchak as a sacrifice. And in fact, here is the ethical reason why you shouldn't offer your child is a sacrifice. Now, if we focus only on the second part, what we get then is an argument that, well, religion will always be subservient to ethics. Religion will never ask you to do something unethical. 
that's probably not right either. Unfortunately, I, I wish it were to be honest, but it's, it's not. I think it's I think it's factually not. It's historically not, and I think it's factually not uh, in terms of our own experience and in terms of the history of of Judaism. Luckily, the story is actually not that simple in the end either. It doesn't just say, "Here's the bottom line: Don't ever offer a child as a sacrifice." That would be bad ethics and therefore bad religion. The story, and this goes back to the point Ray Bergman made a few minutes ago, Avram is rewarded for being willing to offer his child as a sacrifice at the same exact time that he's told that God will never again ask for a child as a sacrifice because it's unethical. So what we actually have is a really dynamic story where it's simplistic to say faith supersedes ethics, as Kierkegaard does. It's simplistic to say ethics must constrain faith as I would love to, as other people do do. Instead, what we get is a story that says, look, there may be a time where faith challenges ethics. What's our response to that challenge? Well, it's complicated. On one level, we may have no choice but to obey religion. If there's a halacha, if there's a religious call that says, that seems to us to be unethical, we may have no choice but to say, okay, but we can't figure out a way out of it. It is, it is the halachic mandate, and so we follow that. But the important thing is, to, is not to say, and so I abandon all of my ethical intuitions. I hereby learn that my ethics were wrong. No, no. If that were true, we could end the story halfway through. That's not, that's not the end story. At the same time that we are willing to follow, we also have to be attuned to an ever higher understanding of what God may want from us. It may well be that if we probe hard enough, even as we're willing to go ahead with our actions, which seem to us unethical, even as we're going to do that, we may have to be attuned to the fact that if we probe even deeper, we may find out that maybe God actually doesn't want us to do that. Maybe there is some deeper value that will be revealed to us, some evolving understanding that will come to us that will say like, actually, actually, where I thought there was a clash between faith and ethics, that's now been rolled back. And now I understand how they get along. Now, unfortunately for us on a day-to-day -day basis, that's prophetic. Right? I mean, Avram here is an angel of God. This is not something that's easily replicated where we can say, ah, okay, so now that I saw Avram do it, all I have to do is figure out my way out of problems. But the story seems to be uh, demonstrating, not, not, not teaching, not saying like, here's the bottom line, because there is no bottom line, but demonstrating a really dynamic religious experience of navigating a clash between faith and ethics where Avram is prepared to follow faith over ethics, but also at the same time, prepared to have his ear open to a higher call from God telling him that actually he doesn't have to do that. And there are a number of Jewish thinkers in the last couple of centuries. Uh, Malbim is one, uh, Emmanuel Levinas is another, and Rabbi Norman Lamb is a third, who have said that actually the high point of our watching Avram's character is not that he's willing to sacrifice Yitzchak. Because first of all, God told him to, and like, how is he going to say no? And second of all, uh, as Sharon said, other people did do it. So like, it might not even have shocked him all, all that much as the way it shocks us. The high point is that after walking three days, after investing his entire emotional being in preparing to sacrifice Yitzchak, when that angel comes and says, don't do it, Avram pivots on a dime and doesn't do it. And that's actually astonishing. It's really a, 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 an, a, an astonishing portrait of a person of faith who even at the point where after three days of preparation is about to do the single hardest thing he's ever done in his life. When the angel says, don't do it, he immediately, he doesn't say, oh, come on, let me just go ahead with it. There is a Midrash that says so, but uh, in the shot, he, he immediately turns and says, okay, there's a ram, fantastic, I'll take the ram. And that willingness to turn around when God calls him to not do it uh, is a moral high point of the story. Uh, it's, a, it's a spiritual high point of the story. It's also a personal high point of the story. That this is a remarkable person who's able to step down from the precipice where he had finally gotten to a point where he thought he was going to do something incredibly difficult, but also incredibly meaningful. And when God says, actually, I don't want it, steps back. And that's not a small thing to do.
But the story is one of, of, of negotiation, navigation, and, and the development. Um, now, I'll, I'll just add one last, one last uh, layer to this, and this is sort of re-injecting the Akeda into the grand story of Avraham. Remember that Buber said, you know, the beginning was giving up on the past, and the uh, Akeda is giving up on the future. The end of Perakaf Bet, the last thing we'll read in Parshat Vayera, is the notice, this letter that he gets from home about the birth to his family of a whole bunch of kids, right? Eight kids and, and, and the birth of Rivka. And that put on hold, it's like unclear why we hear about this, until Perakaf Dalid. So we're gonna have to wait two weeks to get to Parshat Chayesara. But in Perakaf Dalid, suddenly Avraham is going back home. He's not physically walking back home, but he's sending his messenger to go back home. And he actually gets a bride for Yitzchak from his ancestral homeland. And although we said a few minutes ago, uh, in response to Sharon's point, that Avram and Yitzchak never speak again and are not even in the same place again, that's true. But Avram does arrange for Yitzchak's marriage in Perakaf Dalid. And in that way, the end of our story is oddly happy. Not happy because Avram is happy or Yitzchak is happy. I assume that they never recovered from this. But happy in the sense that the big story actually takes a strangely positive turn. And whereas until now, Avram had totally abandoned his family back in Haran and had no hope for the future with Yitzchak, suddenly we see him drawing from his ancestral home and guaranteeing a future through Yitzchak. So the Akedah actually somehow manages to, although it, again, for sure traumatizes the characters involved personally, also somehow manages to set them up for the future where not only does Avram not lose his past and future, but actually he manages to bridge the past and bring it into the future and actually establish the family, the covenantal family going forward. All right, I think I've probably said too much and said too much unclearly. So I will, I will stop here. Uh, let me pause this. I saw that there's a couple more things in the chat if there's any specific uh, questions. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll leave this for, for later for a minute. But uh, yeah, so I will pause here. I mean, short answer to uh, David Freud and is no. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with that. I'm happy to look it up, but it's a yes or no question that you asked. <laughs> so the answer, oh, okay. And I'll, Thank you. I'll, I'll certainly click on that link and have a look it's, later. It's on. all turning on one word, chasachta. He flips it all the way around 180 degrees. All right. I will, uh, I'll have to have a, have a look. Thank you for that. Okay. So that's, uh, okay. So I'm, I'm going to turn it back over to Rabbi Strachler. That's Okay. I'd like just like to thank uh, Professor Fuller for uh, his uh, willingness to engage us in uh, this uh, his book and in uh, his ideas about the Akeda, and uh, I thought it was really a, a uh, an eye opening uh, journey through uh, uh, much of the Middle East and uh, a long long swaths of our history to be able to uh, to be able to bring all these ideas together and um, to um, to be able to think about the questions of morality that, that come out of a text. It is so old and that's been thought about so much, but to be able to be is something of great meaning and great, uh, great purpose. Something that we got a little taste of uh, in, uh, in uh, Professor Kohler's presentation this evening, but it comes out even more when uh, you see how the Akeda is, is, is brought up to life in Israeli history and in, uh, in the 20th century in the writings of so many. And so uh, to be able to appreciate the, um, the message, but also to appreciate the questions that uh, these texts and these traditions allow us to explore. So thank you all for participating. And uh, may we read Parshas Vayera the Shabbos with new eyes and with more questions. Thank you very much. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roy Bergman. Thank you, Rabbi. This was fabulous. And Glad you enjoyed that. Uh, Professor Kohler. Wonderful. Just wonderful. Really. Sharon, thank you for your question. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, I'm sorry that uh, Professor Kohler was not able to get to your question. I'm, uh... Oh, it's, that's not a problem. He actually 
uh, got uh, got through to it. Uh, I was just going to say that the word Nisa actually has five Hebrew meanings, wow. and one of the meanings is actually a sign. I mean, my my thought is that uh, the Akedah was never a trial for Abraham; it was actually a sign for Abraham. But the sign is in a totally different uh, direction from what he did. Although, uh, you know, it was nice to see the pantheon of. Uh, <laughs> Of commentators that he uh, that he brought into this, but uh, there's a couple of other issues that he didn't uh, discuss, which I think are critical. But I'm, I just wondered if um, he was going to give us his email address. Do you have access to that? Because yeah, uh, if I can, you know, yeah. contact him privately to. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll, uh, I'll throw it up onto the chat now, and um, so it's Kohler at yu.edu. I'll just throw it onto the, the chat for everyone. Okay, there it is. Kohler, or just Kohler, okay. So it's, um, and uh, Professor Kohler happens to be very good about it, getting back to questions. Uh, he lives on these things. So uh, I, I anticipate that you'll be able to, you know, if you throw it, throw it to him, he will, he will get back to you. Okay. Yeah, the actual thing you mentioned about the uh, Rashi, makes a very interesting comment about that, that they went with Lev Shaveh, meaning that both Yitzchak and Abraham, so while well, there's no dialogue in the text, it was obviously felt that they did have a common purpose going up there. Amazing. And he was, if he was 37 years old, he certainly wasn't a young, naive kid. He actually was in cahoots with Abraham with whatever they were gonna go through. And there was something there. And if you go with Nisa being a sign, it's actually a sign to the two of them of what was going to be, but uh, Avra, but uh, Hashem didn't reveal it until the end of the Akedah with the uh, with the events. But uh, they're very, 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 uh, very scholarly, very well done. Absolutely, thank, yeah. thank you, thank, thank you for arranging it. Pleasure. <clears throat> okay, Shukach, everyone, have a good evening, and thank you all for participating. Sharon, are you asking something? I think you're muted. Sharon, unmute yourself. Hi, Sharon, you're muted. Oh, I forget what I wanted to say now. No but worries. anyway, Thank one of the interesting you. points is that likely uh, Yitzchak showed no signs of rebelling against the whole act when he realized it was him that was going to be the korban. He acquiesced as we read in the text. And that is probably because he also was aware, given that he's only one generation uh, from his father and knowing about uh, the surrounding cultures, he probably figured, okay, I'm doomed. <laughs> you know, I'm doomed. And he didn't, he didn't, uh, he didn't seem to argue about it. He just became the Korban and that was it. And also it's so interesting when you think about it, how Christianity latches on to the whole uh, thing about sacrifice and developing a whole religion about that from another standpoint. But it's fascinating. The whole subject of sacrifice is, I'm trying to remember, maybe you remember, since my anesthetic, I, I have such a poor memory. Do you remember which opera it was that dealt um, with child sacrifice. The, it was a famous um, opera. The Greek play by Aeschylus, Agamemnon, um, who sacrifices his daughter to get the winds so the Greek army can sail to Troy. And what was the opera, do you know? It wasn't an opera, it was a play. But uh, there was an opera. I saw it, but I can't remember the name, nor the, nor the composer, nor the librettist who wrote the... Uh, who wrote the opera put it, and put it to music for a composer to create. Anyway, I'll look it up. Okay, thank you. It was a very interesting, very interesting. talk. Thank very, you. very, you I enjoyed it a lot. Very good, very good. Thank you all. I love being stimulated. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.